Pull the rope. Okay. We're going to, in this session, just finish up what we interrupted last time because we ran out of time to finish it. And we're talking about the counsel of God. We're talking about God's alternative. Um, Actually, it's not so much that God has an alternative. It's that everything else is an alternative to what God has decreed. God's ways and God's truth is the absolute. Unfortunately, the world has sought alternatives. Uh, salvation from other sources. And uh, even more unfortunately, Christians have done the same thing. So we're talking about the truth of God, the counsel of God that is there uh, for us, for our salvation. And salvation not only to be saved and go to heaven, but salvation from the sin bondages and uh, sinful reactions and so forth that give us uh, complex problems in our in our character in our personalities and just make it uh, make us not very good at coping with life and sends many Christians to the counselor's couch. Well, they should come running to the counsel of God instead. Uh, when we broke off last time, I was beginning to enumerate some of the things that I would refer to as the resources or the weapons of the warfare that God has made available to us. We talked about the name of Jesus and how that identification with Christ is the first and most important thing. If we are found in Christ, then we can stand against demonic powers. We can approach God with boldness and receive grace to help in time of need. Uh, All of our resources, all the other resources, can only benefit us if we are in Christ. So to be in Christ, to share in His identity, to be found in Him, to have the name of Jesus as uh, belonging to us is the first point of consideration. And there are two other resources I want to focus on, though we'll break them down into sub-points. One is the Spirit of God, and the other is the Word of God. Now, of course, the Word of God contains the truth of God. The Spirit of God is God Himself. His, uh, it's, it's God empowering us, God dwelling in us, and giving us that supernatural aspect of, of what it means to be a Christian. You see, Christianity is not just a, another belief system, of which there are many. It's not just the best of many belief systems. It's not just the truest of all views that claim to be true. It is a life of, with supernatural origins and dynamics. And when the Spirit of God is in a person, that person is a Christian. When the Spirit of God is not in a person, that person is not a Christian. And the Spirit of God is God. And there's no limits to what God can perform if it is in His purposes to do so in the life of the believer. Fortunately, the things that God desires to do for us are things that are for our benefit. And, uh, And therefore, we should be eager to see what the Holy Spirit can do to change us in the ways that we desire and need to be changed. And let me talk to you about some of the ways in which the Bible indicates the Holy Spirit uh, assists us. Now, we've already talked about (coughs) the need to come before the throne of grace to seek grace to help in time of need. And grace is, of course, that supernatural assistance that God gives to us. That grace comes through the Holy Spirit. In Hebrews chapter 10, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Grace. Jesus was full of the Spirit, and it is said of him that we beheld his glory full of grace and truth. The Holy Spirit is called both the Spirit of Grace and the Spirit of Truth. Now, the grace of God, which is imparted by the Holy Spirit, is an empowerment to do what is right. God never intended that people would live the Christian life on their own. God never intended just to lay out a better set of rules than those that existed from Moses in the Old Testament and uh, and just raise the bar and tell us to pole vault over it by our own strength, even though we weren't doing very well at the lower level that he'd already set in the Old Testament. That's not what God has done. God has come to give us himself, to give us life of a supernatural sort that changes us and empowers us and gives us grace to do what cannot be otherwise done humanly. Now, among the things that the Holy Spirit's 
assistance uh, does for us. Uh, there's, there's much help that we receive from the Holy Spirit. Uh, first of all, we know that the Holy Spirit convicts of sin. Jesus said that in John chapter 16. He said, when the Holy Spirit has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. So, if we have a problem with sin in our lives, the first thing that the Holy Spirit does to help us is to let us know that that is sin. He convicts us of misbehavior. Now, I, of course, from my earlier talks in this series, you know that I believe that most things that people call mental illness are really just misbehavior at a mental level, a misbehaving mind. And misbehaving is, is sin. If you do what you're not supposed to do, if you do what is not bringing glory to God, what is not what God designed you to do, if your reactions uh, to things and to life's challenges are not what God has commanded that they should be, that is sin. And the Holy Spirit is there to convict of sin. Uh, he also is there, uh, possibly more importantly to the Christian who's already repented of sin, the Holy Spirit produces fruit, what Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit. Now, the, let me read to you, or it would be good if you could read along, too, because it will be to your benefit. In Galatians 5, 16 through 23, it's a rather long passage, but we get the whole truth by reading the whole context. Galatians 5, 16 through 23, Paul says, I say then, walk in the Spirit... And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. People go to counselors because they can't stop drinking, can't stop reading pornography, can't stop gambling, can't stop losing their temper. Well, those are works of the flesh, as we shall see. If you walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Why? Because the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry. Every kind of addiction could be called idolatry, putting something first ahead of God in your life. Sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath. Selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, which means patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law, which is what tells us the meaning of his statement in verse 18, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Why are you not under the law? Because you keep it. There's no law against the things that the Spirit leads you to do. So you don't fall under the condemnation of the law if you're led by the Spirit. But notice the behaviors that are the desires and the lusts of the flesh that are manifest, he says. Well, what is the cure for those behaviors? Well, walk in the Spirit, verse 16, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Why will you not? Because the Spirit in whose power you are walking produces the opposite behaviors. Love, joy, peace. Now, if you have joy, then you're not going to be complaining of depression. If you have peace, you're not going to be complaining of anxiety. Now, maybe I worded that in an, in an unfortunate way, because if I say, if you have joy, you won't be complaining of depression. If you have peace, you won't be complaining of anxiety. And by saying that, it may put pressure on people who are experiencing anxiety or depression to say, well, I can't complain about it, or he'll say, I don't have joy and peace, and I'm not walking in the Spirit. Uh, it's not the complaining of it that's the problem. It's, it's the indulging in it that's the problem. It's the succumbing to it. <clears throat> I personally believe that depression is fairly normal, occasionally. I believe that everyone, at one time or another, has something, uh, some mood that is 
is low and is not, there's no pr particular rational basis for it. With both men and women, this can have to do with hormonal cycles. It can also have to do with diet. It can have to do with not having enough sleep. I'm sure many of you have found that to be the case. You get depressed and you happen to notice it's late at night and you go to bed and wake up and most of the time you won't be as depressed as you were before. If you go many days without sleep, then you'll, you'll, you'll start being very irrational and having you know depression or some other reaction. It's been seen that if people's brains don't get enough sleep over a period of a lot of days in succession, it really causes them to go kind of nutty. And things can happen. But depression can be a physical thing. There, there can be uh, sickness. There can be an infection, a virus. You can be physically depressed. That can make you lose strength and make you f inclined to be emotionally depressed. You may be depressed because of guilt. You might not even know what you're guilty of because you haven't re really allowed the Holy Spirit to search you and know you and reveal to you. But there may be something there that you know is not right, some relationship you've left unresolved. All kinds of things can cause you to feel depressed, some of them sinful, some of them natural. Not all of them bad. Now, depression, if you get depressed, you ought to ask yourself, like David said, why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? And the answer might turn out to be, well, because I, there's sin there, because there's guilt there, because there, I, I'm, I, I've got this nagging awareness that I have not done towards somebody what I should have done, that I lied and I didn't go back and, and clear the record, that I cheated somebody and didn't go back and make it right, that, that I've been gossiping uh, and I did not repent, you know, I've got some kind of thing there, and, and for some reason I'm depressed. Well, the reason is there's a problem between you and God over this thing. Now, it may not be that. When you say, why are you cast down on my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? It might just be because your circumstances are very sad circumstances. Somebody you love has just died or moved away. Or you've, you, some hope or ambition that you had has just been dashed by some turn of events that you weren't anticipating. It may be... As I say, something related to your diet or your sleep patterns or some other totally natural thing. The thing is, if you are experiencing depression, first thing you need to ask yourself is, why am I not experiencing the joy that the Bible says is normative? That we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's normal. Now, the answers can be multiple. One can be, well, because I, there's sin in my life. If that's the case, then obviously repentance is the way out of there. Another, and, and that's because you haven't been walking in the, in the Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You won't sin while you're walking in the Spirit. And you won't have guilt. So you'll be joyful. There are other things, though. It may be that you'll find that your, your depression that you're feeling is not, is not based on any sin. And there's nothing you can do about it particularly except to just say, well, I'll rejoice in the Lord. But saying I will rejoice in the Lord doesn't mean I'll feel happy right away. It just means that I'm not going to allow myself to define my, my day and my mood by the way I'm feeling at the moment. The feelings do not have a rational basis. It may be probably I better get more sleep tonight or I better you know, not eat those dairy products I'm allergic to or whatever it is. You know, I mean, if you know what's causing it, then you just adjust your thinking. Okay, I've got this. I've got this. I'm going to feel depressed today. But I'm not going to let that define my attitude. I'm not going to uh, live in, under gloom about it. I'm not going to bring everybody else down about it. I'm not going to mope around. I can say, okay, I'm feeling low. But I will still rejoice in the Lord. I'll still be happy inwardly that I love the Lord and that God loves me. And, and I know that this too will pass. And, and, uh, and if you see, there are the ways to accept things like depression. Some of the prophets seem to get depressed at times. Now, they, they didn't have anything like what anyone would call clinical depression. But to speak of clinical depression, I think, is a misnomer because clinical means medical. Now, there are, of course, thyroid problems and other kinds of chemical things that can cause someone to get depressed, but that's not psychiatric. You don't, do, you don't go to a psychiatrist for thyroid problems. You go to a regular doctor about that. Uh, there are medical problems that can make your body drained of energy, physically depressed and so forth, and that can obviously uh, that can obviously put pressure on your mood. 
as can, as I say, times of the month for women especially, and, and there are hormonal changes that take place in men also, there, there can be physical pressures. There can be circumstantial pressures. The fact of the matter is, a person can overcome depression so long as he's found out that he's not depressed over some guilt or some sin he's not dealing with. As long as my conscience is clear, I can overcome depression simply by saying, well, I don't really read anywhere in the Bible that life is supposed to be a, a happy set of circumstances, that I'm supposed to live a life without any burdens. Uh, there are burdens. There is a cross to bear and so forth, and I rather wish I didn't feel so low, but if that's what I have to endure for Jesus today, I, uh, my conscience is clear, and I will rejoice in the Lord, and I may feel low for a, a long time. I don't know. But usually, if people maintain this attitude, in other words, they don't begin to define their their attitude by their feelings, but they choose to rejoice in the Lord, normally the feelings won't stay all that long. Now, I'm not going to make any rosy promises about this. You may experience depression for protracted periods of time. There are prolonged temptations. Uh, a, a mood can be a temptation. But an attitude is a choice. You may come under a low mood for various reasons I've said. And sometimes very justifiably, feel, you feel sad about things. You weep with those who weep. And there is a time for weeping. Blessed are those who mourn, Jesus said. They shall be comforted. But they're not comforted by taking an antidepressant. They're not comforted by psychoanalysis. They're comforted by the presence of God, the Spirit of God. It, it says of, of God that he draws near to him that is of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. That's in the Psalms, and I'm afraid I don't remember the exact psalm. Maybe you do. Uh, I think it's Psalm 37, 38. Uh, here it is. Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite, that means crushed spirit. Now, what this means to me is that although no one enjoys a broken heart, no one enjoys having a crushed spirit because that would be a very depressing thing to have, yet God draws near to people at times like that. There's a blessedness in mourning. There is something to embrace. They thank God that I, that I am not one of those who are laughing when there's when mourning is called for maybe maybe god is putting his burden on me who knows god's mourning over many things maybe he's letting you share in his emotion i don't know i mean i i don't claim to have a one size fits all answer to why any given party is depressed at any given time i'm saying though that a, a low very low mood can be very normal it can be the will of god it can be very appropriate To feel sad can be very appropriate, but it is not appropriate to cop an attitude of self-pity and gloom and to allow others to be made miserable by the fact that you're having a, a low day. And it is also possible to be content in it. Contentment is the attitude that you choose in all things. Paul said, I've learned whatever state I'm in, there went to be content. If you're experiencing something that you would call depression, you can choose to be content in it. Once you're content, you're happy. It doesn't mean you feel happy. Contentment is happiness. Unfortunately, we are such shallow people that we come to define whether we're happy or sad by our emotions and our moods. And it seems strange to us to hear Jesus say something like, happy are those who mourn. Wait a minute. If you're mourning, you're not happy, right? Well, Jesus said you are Jesus said, you're happier. Happier are those who weep. Well, they don't feel happy at moments like that, but there is, an, there is a deep, substantial, fundamental sense of well-being and contentment in God that is really the happiness that everyone else is seeking by keeping a gay mood. People who are trying to maintain lofty spirits uh, and and to to be amused and entertained and drugged and all kinds of things to keep them happy, what they're seeking is a shallow kind of happiness which does not produce that deep down fundamental, deep rooted sense of all is well between me and God. 
I, all, I am secure. I am content. My conscience is clear. I am enjoying God in a deep level that is much deeper than my emotions. Now, you might say, well, that sounds really strange, Steve. If it does, I pity you. Because I would hope that you've known that by experience. I would hope that what I'm describing, you're saying, Amen, man, I've, I, I, I've been there a thousand times. Because that, I think, is normal. The Bible does not encourage us to live our lives at the emotional level. There's nothing wrong with having emotions. But when emotions are the defining characteristic of who I am or what attitude I've got right now, it, that is sin. Emotions are just like any other temptation. Is money a good thing or a bad thing? Well, of course you can't answer that. The question is unanswerable. It, money can be bad. That is, it can, it, it can be a temptation to do evil. It can be very good. It can meet your needs that need to be met. Money is an asset. It is something that God does not condemn and which we often need, but it is also something that can present certain temptations and wrong motivations. Moods are that way too. Emotions are that way too. They are God-given. There's nothing wrong with them. We shouldn't deny that they exist. We shouldn't try to be stoic, moodless people. We should embrace emotions. But like money, money can enhance life. Emotions can enhance life, but they can also become a temptation to self-pity. Oh, I'm so unhappy. Well, I mean, I, I just tell myself, you know, if I'm feeling unhappy, what, what right do I have to feel happy? You know, I mean, what, what does God owe me? What does the world owe me? Nothing. And therefore, I don't get all gloomy about it. And I, you know, usually I just say, well, I'll wait till I go to bed. I'll probably feel better in the morning. And usually do. In the meantime... I will rejoice in the Lord. You know, when David said uh, to his soul, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? His, his counsel to his soul was hope in God. This is uh, found in Psalm 40, what? 42, 40, somewhere right now, 42. Uh, I'm, I'm picking some of these scriptures out, out of my head without them in my notes so I don't know the actual references but um, I was pretty sure it was in the 40s but I'm, I'm not seeing it there at the moment um, 45 no sorry about that wish I could give you the, the verse numbers in any case maybe you find it yeah, there's actually two psalms in a row I was apparently mistaken 42 okay thank you 42 and um, is it also in 41 or where? Because there's two Psalms in a row, yeah. 42.11 and 43.5. Okay, there we go. And it's also, by the way, in 42.5. There's, there's three times in two Psalms uh, where he has essentially the same question. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Then he counsels his own soul according to a godly counsel. Hope in God. For I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. His countenance means, it's a Hebrewism, when God's countenance shines upon you, it means God's favor is upon you. God is giving you grace and favor and so forth. So the help I receive from his grace, from his countenance shining on me, is what I will rejoice in. I'll praise him for that. I'm going to hope in God. Now, hope is for things that have not yet materialized. Paul says that, of course, in Romans. He says, why would you hope for it if you already had it? Hope is about something future. When you are depressed, you are momentarily, maybe, maybe for a period of time, not all that, you're not feeling all that good. But in such a circumstance, you can command your heart and your soul to hope in God. Hope that, I mean, God will show his favor again. This is not the last chapter of my life. And we got to, there is truth in the scripture to elevate us above our circumstances, to look down at them in a more objective way and say, I'm feeling kind of low. This is kind of a big trial. I'm really bummed out about all this. But, but you know what? Kind of lift myself above and say, I'm an eternal being. I'm not going to have this mood forever. I probably won't even have it tomorrow. If I do, I probably won't have it this time next week. I mean, this is temporary. It came to pass. It didn't come to stay. It's here and it'll be gone. And if it's not gone in an hour... Or in 24 hours or 48 hours, it'll still be gone someday. I will hope in God and I will find my comfort and my stability in the fact that my emotions do not have to govern me. 
So I'm not giving you some kind of a plastic counsel that, that, that sounds like it should be true but isn't. That all you have to do is just say, okay, I'll rejoice in God. Suddenly the gloom is gone. Suddenly all, all the flowers bloom. The sun comes out. And I'm as happy as a lark. That doesn't always happen. Depression can stay. But you don't have to take a drug to get rid of it. You can live with it. You can say, okay, this burden is upon me. My heart is burdened. I don't know why. Maybe I'm supposed to be driven to prayer. Maybe God is trying to you know, separate me to himself, to seek, seek him out more. I don't know what. But in the meantime, until I know and until it goes away, I will hope in God. And when you begin to hope in God, it makes all the difference in the world. You would not sorrow as others who have no hope. As Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4.13. So, instead of seeing every undesirable emotion and mood that comes on us as something to be escaped as quickly as possible, of course, that's our American way of thinking. We're so comfortable. We're so pampered. That every sacrifice, every pain... You know, we, we've got, we're used to just running off and getting somewhere. I got a headache. I'll run down get some Tylenol. I got appendicitis. Better run down and get an operation. We've got a hospital at every corner where we need them. You know, got a bad mood. Run down and get an antidepressant drug. Uh, who says we're not supposed to suffer some of this? We can find grace to help in it. And that is the Spirit's work. He gives us joy, which is not, strictly speaking, emotional. I am a joyful person. I'm a happy person. I'm not uh, always blissful. That is for sure. And I have many disappointments. Some of them are, are not happy circumstances. But, but I've never known God to fail, to produce. When I'm walking in the Spirit, now I haven't always walked in the Spirit, but my, when I'm not walking in the Spirit, I soon know it, and I go running back to the comfort of the Holy Spirit uh, in times of... Uh, of uh, you know bad low moods or whatever, and there is joy, there is peace, anxiety. People go and take drugs for anxiety, but the Holy Spirit gives peace. The peace of God will keep your hearts and minds. If you are anxious for nothing and in, in everything by prayer and supplication, make your request known to God. Walking in the Spirit means you do what the Spirit said to do. You do it in His power that He gives, but you you let Him lead and you let Him empower. And uh, you trust in God, in His Spirit, and His Spirit then is found to be adequate. We find among the fruits of the Spirit things like self-control, patience, faithfulness, gentleness. If people have outbursts of rage and wrath, they don't have gentleness. If people are uh, incapable of quitting their, their habits, they don't have self-control. Uh, these are problems. People go to counselors for these. They ought to go to the, the, the another count, counselor that Jesus said he would send. The Spirit of Truth uh, who is with you if you're a Christian. By the way, in addition to just uh, you know the momentary uh, power over the lust of the flesh that comes from walking in the Spirit, there's also the, the ongoing and large-scale trans, transformation that takes place in the life through the work of the Holy Spirit. According to 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. 2 Corinthians 3.18, <clears throat> Paul said, But we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Of course, we have to be doing that for this to be true. Are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. By what? By the Spirit of the Lord. By the Holy Spirit. What's happening? We're being transformed from glory to glory. The Greek word is metamorphosized. It's like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. It's a change of nature altogether. It's a total transformation. Into what? Into the image of Christ. Now, the image of Christ, to say we're being transformed into the image of Christ doesn't mean we, we wear a... a a Middle Eastern robe and sandals and, and grow our hair out and our beards out. I mean, if that's how we picture Christ looking in the pictures. That's not the image that we're being transformed into. We're being transformed into who he is, what he is, into a, a replica of his character and nature. And this is done by, as we shall see in a later scripture, 
the infusion of the divine nature into us. But this is done by the Spirit of God. What this means is that as we keep gazing at Jesus, instead of looking at ourselves, as we behold as in a glass the glory of the Lord, and of course, you go to a psychologist and that's the last thing they're going to turn your attention to. But as you behold the glory of the Lord, then we are changed from glory to glory into the image of Christ more. And this is the ongoing thing. This is not just moment by moment resisting this temptation, that temptation. Our character is transformed. And we're, it becomes more and more like that of Jesus. In uh, the very next chapter, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, although the reference here is not so uh, overtly to the Holy Spirit, we see that we have the same phenomenon addressed here. In verse 16, Paul says, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. So, the Holy Spirit is transforming us from glory to glory. Day by day, we're being renewed in the inward man. That ought to have some effect. That ought to have some evidence. If you walk in the Spirit, if that is your habitual habit, that's redundant to say a habitual habit. Is it? Better use some other word. A habitual pattern. To walk in the Spirit, then you will be experiencing transformation. Now, when I was... Uh, baptized in the Spirit when I was 16, I noticed a, a, a radical in, instant change in, in one area of my life, and that was in the area of temper. I had a very short fuse and a very bad temper when I was uh, younger, and uh, it, it doesn't always happen for people this way, and it didn't happen that way in every area of my life for me either, but one thing I noticed immediately is when I got baptized in the Spirit, uh, I just was over, it's like overwhelmed by the peace of God. And it made me more patient. It made me more... Um, I just didn't lose my temper. It's not because I suddenly felt convicted about losing my temper and realized I better stop doing that. It's just that I didn't... I wasn't inclined to. The anger was, no, was not part of my personality anymore. And that was instant. Now, I don't... Other people claim, you know, that, and I think truly, that when they got saved, they suddenly came off heroin with no... Uh, no withdrawal, or they, they overcame their pornography habit instantly by repentance and so forth, and other Christians struggle with those things. after. I mean, different people have different experiences. But one thing that should be certainly normative is that everyone should have some testimony, because it will be true, if they are walking in the Spirit and filled with the Spirit, that there will be some change, some move in the direction of sanctification, and a continual move from glory to glory, day by day, into that image of Christ being renewed differently. Not by applying psychological novelties, but by beholding the glory of the Lord as in a glass, looking unto Jesus, and allowing the Holy Spirit to, to work within us. Now you might say, well, you know, Christians talk a lot about this business of just walk in the Spirit and let the Holy Spirit do His work and let go and let God. I mean, all this, it's, they're nice little cliches, but what does it really mean? I mean, what does that have to do with what I do on Wednesday morning? You know, I mean, what does it mean, walk in the Spirit? Well, <coughs> I'll just tell you, I personally believe the Holy Spirit is sovereign himself. And, I mean, sovereign in the sense that he doesn't need us to dictate his behavior to him. He has a plan already, and he knows how to get it done. All he requires from us is cooperation. Um if we are looking to someone other than God for our help, then I, we are not cooperative. It's like um, <clears throat> if, if my, when my children were little, if, if their shoe was untied, and they asked me to tie their shoe for them. So they come to me, and I, I can tie a shoe relatively efficiently and quickly, but if they keep saying, well, let me get my finger there, let me, put that, let me, let me turn that loop, and, and their hands are in there with mine, I can't even get the job done. I just take my hands off and say, well, when you're done, you come to me. I can, I can do this for you. And as long as someone's trusting in himself, trying to interfere, trying to bring in extraneous assistance that isn't God's, and yet asking God to help, I don't think, I don't think it's going to happen. I think that it means that we put our whole trust in God, in, in his spirit to accomplish it. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And to walk in the spirit means that I adopt a continual commitment habit of surrender 
turning it over the problem over to God. Say, okay, God, this is this is your problem. It was my problem before I was a Christian, but now I'm your problem. <laughs> and therefore my problems are your problem. Uh, you may have read Brother Lawrence, uh, who wrote uh, The Practice of the Presence of God, and he he said that, you know, he feels as close to God at all times during the day, whether he's washing dishes or in prayer or whatever. But one thing he said repeatedly in his writings was that whenever he sins, after he's repented, he just says to God, well, God, you know, this is me. This is what I can do. You know, I'm not quoting him exactly, but the idea is that this is the best I can do is what is this failure. And this is what I'll continue to do unless you fix it. You know, I mean, because I can't do it. I can't fix it. I'll just rest in you. I will not look to other physicians. Uh, there is balm in Gilead. There is help there. I will not hew out for myself broken cisterns that can hold no water. I will trust fully in the living water, the fountains of living water, which is the Holy Spirit. And I will yield myself to the potter as a, as a piece of clay on the wheel, realizing much change has to take place, but the clay can't bring about any of it. The only way the change can take place is if the clay is yielded. If the clay is, is, uh, is not strong, has no strength of its own. Paul, when he talked about his thorn, God said to him, My grace is sufficient for you because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. The weaker you are and the weaker you know yourself to be and the more you throw yourself wholly on God, the more it can be done. If I have a, a, a mechanical problem with my car, I'll tell you just in case you don't know, I don't know anything about auto mechanics. I, uh, if I got in there with a wrench, uh, you'd probably have to get a new car rather than it would probably cease to be fixable. Um, but if I take it to a mechanic, I commit the job to him. I give it to him and I expect him to do the work for me. If I would come in while he's working on it and say, here, let me, let me turn a few bolts here. I, I've got some ideas of my own. Uh, it would not speed up the process. If anything, it would aggravate the problem. Now, I'm not saying that you don't put any effort into... Your sanctification, you absolutely must. There's a warfare to fight. You're wrestling against principalities and powers. You are struggling against flesh and so forth. But what I'm saying is, walking in the Spirit means that I no longer put confidence in me or anyone else but God to get the job done. If I get disappointed with myself, it means I was counting on myself more than I should have been. I can repent of sin, but if, I, if, if when I repent... I'm kicking myself to say, man, I, I, I thought I'd do better this time. I'm really, you know, I'm after, you know, uh, I'm real disappointed with myself. And then I'm, I'm missing the point. I can repent of sin because I'm grieved that I've hurt God, but I'm not surprised at myself because I'm not, I don't have any confidence in myself anyway. Uh, my confidence is in God. Corrie Ten Boom used to like to illustrate this uh, when she would speak places. She'd have a a, a glove, uh, a very limp woman's glove. And she'd hold it up empty and say, well, look here, how much strength does this glove have? What can this glove do? Do you think Do you think this glove could lift up this Bible here off this podium here? Let's see if we can do that. And she'd you know, try to bring the glove into contact with the Bible, and sure enough, the glove was absolutely impotent uh, to lift up the Bible. But then she'd put the glove on. And she say, now, do you think this glove can pick up this Bible? And obviously, the glove could do not only that, but could do anything that Cory Ten Boom had the strength to do. Anything that she had the skill to do, that glove could do while it was on her hand. But not because it had changed. In fact, if the glove were made stronger in its own strength, it would prevent her from being able to do it. I have a pair of gloves I bought years ago. Uh, they're kind of they're ski gloves. I don't ski, but I bought them for you know extreme cold conditions. They're real thick leather, double layered with padding inside and stuff. And I have these gloves. I never wear them because I can't do anything in them. I mean, I put them on. I can't can't you know count my change. I can't get a key out of my pocket. I have to take them off to do anything. They're too stiff. They're too. They have strength of their own. It interferes with my ability to do anything with them because they have too much of their own strength. And so with us, the more we're relying on man and flesh and the wisdom of man and our own strength and our own stratagems, the less likely we are to really see transformation in our lives. 
the more we are saying, God, I will walk in the Spirit and I'll trust in you to do the work, the more we're going to look back a few weeks from now, a few months from now, a few years from now and say, boy, am I different than I was. And you won't even notice when it was happening because it wasn't made by major uh, victories that you accomplished by doing some extraordinary thing. It'll just be that you're changed from glory to glory, day by day, as you're re- resting in God and relying in Him. And you don't allow the uh, anxieties or the temptations or the burdens or the emotional uh, trials that come upon you, you don't allow those things to distract you from God. You just just take don't take them you know to be very important at all. And, I mean, you need to check. If you have some anxiety or, or 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 sense of guilt or depression, you do need to check. Is this is this a warning signal? This is like the smoke detector's going off. There's some kind of sin. There's something I need to deal with here. But if you check and say, no, there's no sin. This is I got a clear conscience. This is just a trial. This is just a temptation. It's like they say about Smith Wigglesworth that he woke up in the night and his bed was shaking. He looked down at the foot of his bed and the devil was leering at him from the foot of the bed. And he said, oh, it's only you. And he rolled over and went back to sleep. That, I think, if that story is true, if it's not true, it still makes a great illustration. If that story is true, it's, it's a tremendous illustration of what I think is actually the case. Christians get all wrapped up in their problems and in the, the burdens they're bearing and all the challenges they're facing and and the devil is uh, you know, getting the victory and, and they think about those things all the time. And their focus is on the devil. And their focus is on the problem. And you know what? They say if you take a, a, a dime and put it up close enough to your eye, it can block out the whole sun. You can't see the sun. Oh, the sun is zillions of times bigger than a dime, a little dime can block it out if that's the whole thing in your field of vision. And your problem, which is tiny compared to the power of God to resolve it, and by the way, any problem you have or can dream of having, many have had before, and some, I dare say many, have found that God has been able to transform them entirely by the power of His Spirit. But if your focus is on the problem and your desperate attempts to find ways out of the problem instead of just resting in God and saying, God, I'm trusting in you. This is a problem. It's your problem. I, I repent of, of doing what I've done wrong. I will endeavor as you give me the strength to do better in the future. Uh, but if you don't give me the strength, it's not going to happen. I'm not going to be... Um, you know, castigating myself about about weakness. You know my weakness. And I, I desire to not fail, but I will always be weak. Um, I need your strength. Now, this may all sound like so much pious talk, but this is how, this is how transformation comes. This is, how, this is what walking in the Spirit means. I'm trusting in the Spirit of God. And it doesn't mean I'm doing nothing. I'm, and I'm bringing nothing. It means that as I walk in the Spirit, I do what the Spirit convicts me to do what the Spirit has said to do in Scripture, I obey by trusting that God will help me to obey. I wage warfare through the Spirit. Jesus said, if I by the Holy Spirit cast out demons, He said, if I by the Spirit of God cast out demons, then the kingdom has come upon you. Jesus cast out demons, wage warfare through the Spirit. It is simply the case that if I'm facing the devil or any other kind of struggle, uh, I cannot depend on myself. I just have to rest in God and say, well, there's a resource in there that is going to is more than adequate for this problem. And it's not me. So what do I have to struggle with? Uh, I will, in fact, obey God, trust Him with, uh, with the success rate, and, uh, and not overly afflict myself and allow myself to disappoint myself. Over failure, I will repent. I will gr- I will be sorry that I sinned against God truly, but I will not wallow in self disappointment because I never had any reason to expect anything good out of myself anyway. Just out of God, I'll let God do the work. And by the way, I don't want to belittle in any way, shape, or form sin, but a, an individual sin, once repented of. It, uh, sin is not small. I don't want to make you think that I'm thinking sin is okay. You can live with some of that. Uh, the fact of the matter is that sin is, is, is a terrible thing. 
And when you sin, you need to repent of it, and you need to be sincere, and it needs to be heartfelt, and you need to realize that God is grieved by sin. It didn't ruin God's whole day. It didn't throw a total wrench into everything God's trying to do in your life. It can, depending on how much you you define future behavior in terms of patterning after that, that sin. But, but if you repent, if you get back up on your feet and start walking with God again, uh, you don't even have to remember it. You don't even have to, you're not going to have to return to that on some psychologist's couch, couch and, and deal with that. Uh, if you have repented of it, it is as if, it, I believe, between you and God, it's as if it has never happened. Now, if you've done it repeatedly, you may have built a habit that, that's going to be not the quickest thing to break unless God does a remarkable miracle, which he might do. Otherwise, you may just overcome it in the course of time. I mentioned, I think, earlier, very early in this series that in my younger years, there was a, a sin of the flesh that I hated and that I struggled with and uh, I was grieved by. And when I f- felt that I had succumbed to it, I, I repented of it. And I was always saying, God, you know, change me. Give me the victory and so forth. And, and he, he never seemed to. And uh, it almost became uh, a defining secret sin in my own way I thought about myself. I thought, well, I'm a good Christian in most respects, but this particular area is just a, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe this is how I'm going to be the rest of my life. I wasn't content that it should be. But I, I was, uh, you know, tended to think, well, I'm never going to be able to change this. And it was a problem for years and years. And then uh, one day it just went away and it's gone. It's been gone for years. It's, it's, I, I don't know where it went. <laughs> but I was sure relief. And I'll tell you what, it's the kind of thing that had I been seeing a counselor about, I would have been probably convinced it was an addiction of some kind or, or some kind of a mental illness or whatever. It was a moral problem in my nature. I don't know why it was there. I don't know what, why it was a weakness in particular. I can't think of anything I did to feed it, but the, the fact of the matter is it was a spiritual thing. And in time, because I was determined to just keep pressing on with God and not say, well, if I'm, if I'm going to keep having this stumbling thing, I might as well give up on it, on God. I, I mean, there was no, that was not an option. I just had to keep walking in the Spirit the best I knew. And when I would fall, I had to repent and... And uh, eventually it just was gone. And maybe a psychologist or someone else could find some, some explanation of how it went away. I, I just soon give God the glory. I, I, believe that, I believe that deliverance came. But years later than I hoped for it. But it came nonetheless. And that's what we have to remember. We have to keep hoping in God. And we have to live with a degree of contentment. Not contentment about sin, but contentment that God can, if I'm surrendered to him, he can take this away today if he wants to. If he doesn't take it away today, he wants me to keep struggling with it. There's something for me to gain. There's some strength in the battle to be learned. Uh, David said God taught his hands to war. How did he do that? By having him fight a lot of wars. And it says of of the people in Joshua's day that God didn't drive out all their enemies from the land of Canaan immediately so that the people might learn how to conduct themselves in war. God kept enemies on the scene for a while. Eventually they were gone, but not immediately. There is apparently an education in an ongoing struggle. But that doesn't mean we say, boy, am I glad to have this struggle. I hope it stays. Uh, Obviously, sin is, is abhorrent to the believer. And the struggle is a grief. But it is something that we say, well, this is in God's hands. I mean, it's not like I'm disavowing responsibility. If I fall, I take full responsibility. But as far as the responsibility for being able to change, I can't take that. I can't do that. I turn from my sin to God. That's what repentance is. And God does the work. You know, if he doesn't do it, it's not going to happen. But the Holy Spirit is that power, is, is God in us, working to transform us from glory to glory, day by day. But not all the changes come today. Not all of them will be here tomorrow. But we continue to wage the warfare as it arises. We continue to trust in God. We continue to get back on our feet when we've fallen and repent and keep looking unto Jesus. And in the long haul, we look back and say, boy, have I ever gotten changed over the years. Don't remember when all these changes took place. 
but I'm a different person than I used to be. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. By the way, the Holy Spirit also gives counsel and inspiration in addition to these other things. Uh, the Holy Spirit is referred to in Isaiah 11 and verse 2 as the, count, uh, the spirit of counsel and might. Counsel because he guides us and counsels us. Might because he gives us the strength to follow his counsel. Paul also mentions something like this aspect of the Holy Spirit's assistance that he gives us in Romans chapter 8. Romans uh, <coughs> chapter 8, verses 13 and 14. It says, For if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. The Spirit leads us, He counsels us, He directs us. Further down in the same chapter, Paul says in verse six, 26, excuse me, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So you can see that the Holy Spirit even inspires our prayers, even when we don't know what to say. If we just groan, the Holy Spirit knows how to translate that into effectual prayers according to the will of God. And since prayer is that means by which assistance comes from God, this is an invaluable service that the Holy Spirit performs by presenting our prayers to God and inspiring them within us, even, even when we don't know what they are. When you pray in an unknown tongue, you don't know what you're saying. But God does, and the Holy Spirit inspires prayer according to the will of God, even in groans sometimes. By the way, in verse 24, or the same chapter, let me just say this. Uh, it says in verse 22 of Romans 8, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Why? Because of its fallenness, of course. And not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we are Christians, we have the Spirit, and that spirit in us in this fallen world causes us to groan also. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. We are in this body. It will cause us some degree of challenge and problems until it is redeemed. And he's referring there to the redemption of the body as the, as the resurrection when we're glorified. And he says in verse 24, For we are saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Now, we wait for the Holy Spirit to bring about the change. We even wait for and hope for the day when we won't even be in this flesh anymore, when we'll be glorified. We won't have any of these struggles. But it's, it's a life of hope. It's not a life of realization. We live from the time we're converted and we have tasted of the powers of the age to come. Between that and the time that the age to come actually materializes in the new heaven and the new earth and we're glorified. Between there, we live in a time of tension. Partly fallen, partly saved. We live with some measure of defect and struggle. But also with a growing measure of sanctification and holiness and, and victory. And it is a period of time that we live in hope. We're saved in this hope. We don't see it yet. Every man that has this hope in him, however, purifies himself, even as he is pure, it says in 1 John 3. We do, uh, our hope does motivate us to go on with God, to yield to God, to trust in God, to obtain help in time of need from the Spirit of grace. And the Spirit of God is the supernatural one who enables us to overcome. In Romans 8, 2, it says, the, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And also in verse 4, Romans 8, 4, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Does this have anything to do with mental health and, and the kinds of things people talk to doctors about, or psychiatrists about, I should say? 
um, and psychologists, it certainly does have something to do with it. In 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Or some translations say a disciplined mind, but that's fine too. A sound and disciplined mind. Certainly, if a person has a sound and disciplined mind, they don't go off looking for a mental health professional to help them. But where does a sound and disciplined mind come from? The spirit. God has given us a spirit of love. Therefore, anger and hatred and those kinds of things, broken relationships, the resolution to those has come through the spirit working in our lives, his fruit of love, and our acting upon that according to his instructions. Power. We are not victims of, of sin. We are not victims. God's Spirit gives us power and He gives us a sound mind. There is a mental benefit of walking in the Spirit. By the way, He's not given us a spirit of fear. And uh, that means that when we are experiencing fear, anxiety, panic, those kinds of things, the deficiency is in our walk in the Spirit. Perfect love casts out fear. He's not given us a spirit of fear, but of love. And for that reason, instead of telling people that they're okay, everything's all right in the way they're walking with God, they just have a problem that doesn't fall into the category of what the Bible talks about. Uh, We need to let people know what's really true. If you've got torment of fear, if your life is dominated by fear, let me tell you something. It's okay to feel fear once in a while. There is a visceral response to the realization that you are in a life-threatening situation or or that there's something really awful about to happen that causes an adrenaline kind of thing to happen and and the sensation of fear. That's not psychological. That's not psychiatric. That's physiological. And, I mean, a sensation of fear is one thing. To live under the oppression of fear To allow fear to dictate behavior rather than God's word to dictate your behavior. That is sin. Of course, you might be afraid to do certain things God said to do because of the reaction you get from hostile people or the inherent dangers or unpleasantness of the thing that God is saying ought to be done. But if that fear prevents you from doing what you know you should do, that is sin. If you experience the sensation of fear but continue to obey God, that, then that fear is a temptation, not a sin. If you submit to the fear and do what it is dictating rather than what God is dictating you to do, that is sin. Um, the Spirit of God gives us power and love and a sound mind so that we can overcome whatever spirit of fear may come our way. Uh Let's talk now about the Word of God. We've been talking about the Spirit of God as a resource that God has given us. What about the Word of God? It says in Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. If a Christian is a mental patient, a chronic visitor, to people uh, offering therapy. That person is withered spiritually. That person is not a fruitful tree. That person is not well watered. Now, that is at least partially their fault. Maybe entirely. Because there is a remedy for that. The person who delights in the law of God, in the Word of God, and meditates in it day and night, is like a well-watered tree planted by rivers of water. So that even in times of drought, spiritually, uh, because it's by rivers of water, there's more uh, subterranean waters available for its roots to tap into. It's got hidden reserves there. Now, this person does not walk in the counsel 
of ungodly people. He does not seek counsel that originates from ungodly people. Even a, even a Christian counselor who is not himself ungodly might be giving counsel that originates from an ungodly person like Freud or Jung or Maslow. That is still the counsel of the ungodly, even though it comes through an agent who is not personally wicked. But to meditate day and night, I remember, uh, I've said this to people, but I was pleased to hear other people say that this, that this is their conviction also. I remember, I think Ray Comfort was saying on one of his videotapes that when people come to him who've, whose lives are, you know, troubled, messed up, and they're Christians, and they're coming for counseling. He says his first question he asks is, have you been meditating day and night on the Word of God? Well, that usually is the end of the session. Because the answer is obvious. If you were meditating day and night on the Word of God, you wouldn't be in this condition. There's a promise of God to that effect. Unless someone wants to say that the promises of God don't really carry any weight, and God's not faithful, and God makes flippant promises and doesn't keep them, then we're going to have to say, well, let's let God be true and every man a liar. If you are not like a tree planted by rivers of water with your leaf never withering, and bringing forth fruit, the fruit of the Spirit in your season. If that is not happening to you, then there is something that of the first two verses of this psalm that is not happening. You are either walking in the counsel of the ungodly and standing in the way of sinners and sitting in the seat of the scornful, or, and or you are, are not meditating day and night on the Word of God. I'll tell you, I, when, when that lady says, where do you go for counsel? I, I eventually I'd say, well, I guess I just go to the Scripture for counsel. But I don't even remember, you know, running to the scripture in some kind of a panic because of some need for counseling ever. I, I've never really been in such a crisis. I had to go tearing through my Bible, get out of concordance, find some verses relevant. Where's that little promise box with those Bible verses in it for these many crises? I've never really sensed such a crisis. And the reason is, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to take credit for this. This is all the work of God. But I, I just think about the scriptures all the time. Uh, for many years, I washed windows, scrubbed floors, cleaned toilets, and so forth to support myself in the ministry. And I loved it because I usually worked in a, in a place of business after they were closed. I was alone in there. And uh, I didn't like listening to Christian radio or didn't have tapes and stuff. So all I could do is just scrub a floor and think about the scriptures, memorize several books of the Bible and meditate on them day and night. And it was just the most natural thing. It wasn't a discipline. I didn't discipline myself to do that. I, could, I, I took delight in it. I couldn't think of anything else I'd rather think about. Now, that is not super Christian. That is normal Christian. Anything else is subnormal. I'm not a, an exceptional Christian. In many ways, I think I'm very subnormal. I know of things about me you don't know about that I think Christians, that shouldn't be true of Christians. But there are things that are normative. The believer should be meditating day and night on the Word of God. That doesn't mean you can't think of anything else, but it means that nothing you think about escapes the filter of what you know the Word of God to teach. And when you have the option to, to think about anything, you will think about whatever you delight in. Did you know that? You always will. Your thoughts will always return quite naturally to whatever you take the most delight in. If you're in love with someone, you'll be thinking about them every time you don't have to think about something else. You take delight in them. If you're hoping to get a, a new car or or you're excited about a new job prospect or whatever, then whenever you're not made to think about something else, that's going to come to your mind. Whatever is you're taking delight in. The person described in the psalm delights in the law of the Lord. And therefore, it's natural for his thoughts always re to return quite naturally without even awareness that it's happening to the Word of God. Many times, uh, I've just kind of brought myself up short and realized that I've been thinking about some passages of Scripture and I was thinking about the Scripture. I wasn't thinking about the fact that I was thinking about the Scripture. It just, it just happened. Because I, I, I delight in it. And, uh, and I have been, by the grace of God and by the uh, fulfillment of God's promises, I've been stable. I'm an emotionally stable person. I have emotional ups and downs, but you won't notice them too much. And uh, I don't notice them too much. Because I don't spend much time thinking about them. There are better things to think about. And... I would have to say, by the grace of God, most of what I've done has, has seen the blessing of God on it, not in a huge way. I'm, I'm not enormously influential or anything like that. But the things that I've set out to do that I believe are the will of God, generally speaking, I've seen the blessing of God on them. 
And I, I just take that as God fulfilling His promises. And I'm glad He does. It says in Psalm 119, uh, many things, of course, about the Word of God. That whole psalm, the longest chapter in the Bible, is all about the Scriptures and all about the benefits and the value of the Scriptures. Among other things, Psalm 119 says this in verse 9, How can a young man cleanse his way? By getting therapy. (laughs) No, a young man can cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word. And two verses later, verse 11, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. You got problems? You unstable? You need to get cleansed? Well, hide the word in your heart and give heed to it. Take heed to it. That doesn't just mean read it. That doesn't even just mean memorize it. To hide something in your heart doesn't just mean you memorize it. What is hidden in your heart, what is resident in your heart, is what you love, what you're bound to, what you're bonded to, what you're committed to, what you're heeding. You're heeding the counsel of God. How will you cleanse your way? By heeding the counsel of God. By taking heed thereto according to God's word, so it says. Now, many things about the scriptures will give you assistance in the area of uh, emotional, mental stability and behavioral, uh, you know, stability and so forth. Uh, On one hand, the scriptures benefit us by bringing to our mind, as they continually do, the sovereignty of God. As you read the scriptures, as you think on the scriptures, God as the Lord, God as the creator, God as the ruler, God as the sovereign, is continually the underlying message of everything in the Bible, as well as overtly stated in many ways and demonstrated in remarkable cases. Uh, Now, this is I'm not taking on a Calvinist view of of the sovereignty of God, where God even determines who does good and who does bad. And everything they do, good or bad, is his doing, not theirs. I don't take that view. But I do believe that in all things, God is at work. That in all things, God is powerful and wise to manipulate for his advantage and for the advantage of those who serve him. All things. Which means, of course, I can resign myself to the will of God. And I can res- the more I read the scriptures, the more I'm reminded, by the way, I need to be reminded of this all the time because God is invisible and you, don't, you, see, you see things all day long and they're always reminding you of themselves because they're there and they're presenting themselves to your senses dynamically. You don't see God and therefore you need to be reminded. And the scriptures are the principal places where we have this continual reminder of God and his, what he's up to. But as you read the scriptures, as you meditate on the scriptures, your view of God's sovereignty will become in the forefront of your thinking. And that will be useful to you. You need to know that. There are, there's wonderful counsel to you in Psalm 37 along these lines of resting in God's sovereign will, which you can most present to yourself on a daily basis by consideration of the Scripture. In Psalm 37, 3 through 7, it says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who uh, brings wicked schemes to pass. Now, the reason I read those verses is because how many direct imperatives there are. Trust in the Lord and do good. Delight yourself in the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him. Rest in the Lord. Do not fret. Now, none of that makes any sense at all unless we believe that God is in command of things. How can you rest in God if maybe someone other than God is the one in charge of of how things are going? You need to maintain a high view of God's sovereign power and wisdom and intervention and concern. And when you do, you can rest. You can trust. You can commit things to God. And it's a very peaceable state to be in. It does a lot for your depression, your anxiety, uh, and other problems that you might be struggling with. In Job... 
13. And in verse 15, it says, Job said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Now, that's a famous verse, but can you say that? Do you say that? Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Now, it's not though he slay me, yet will I not apostatize. Or though he slay me, yet will I maintain my, um, my stubborn you know, adherence to Christianity. But I will actually trust him. Uh, he doesn't, my trust in God doesn't mean I'm, I'm sure he's going to get me out of this problem. At least not in a conventional way. He might slay me. That'll get me out of all my problems. It'll be quite fine, frankly. Sometimes that's the easiest way out. I'm not, I don't, I'm not entitled to do that to myself. But if God does it, fine. I always, I always know it's the will of God when he does it. If God slays me, that'd be, frankly, excellent. Because uh, he won't do that until it's his will. And after it's his will for me to go, I don't want to stay around. Good heavens, can you imagine living in the world after God no longer has his will for you to be here? What would there be to live for? Um, the whole point is that when we're struggling and dissatisfied and discontent and fearful and anxious and depressed and upset, we need to remember to trust him. He's sovereign. And he's on our side. And we need to trust in his love. We need to trust in his power. We need to rest in him, even if he slays us. We're not trusting in him in order to push a button that relieves us of our problems. Okay, trust God, then it'll go away. No, you trust God, it may not go away. But he won't either. If you trust him, he'll be near. And that's the solution. The solution to the problem is not make the problems go away. The solution to the problem is for God to be strengthening you in the midst of it all. And the word of God, your meditation on scripture will continue to feed this, this tendency to trust in God because of his sovereignty being presented to your consciousness through it all the time. Another way that the word of God helps us in some of the problems that we face uh, in life and so forth is that it, it certainly teaches us the need to die to ourselves. To not make self the idol that it naturally is. And we need the scriptures continually to remind us of that too. Because it is against our grain. It's against our nature. And <coughs> I won't look at all the scriptures I put in the notes there with you. It would take some time to do it. But I will say this. Uh, if you look at John 8, 31 through 36. This is a very important scripture. Uh, if anyone would ask me, how, how can I overcome these sinful attitudes, sinful moods, sinful reactions, sinful behaviors? There are probably two scriptures more than any others that come to mind. This is one of them. Uh, the other is Galatians 5.16, walk in the spirit. And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But this is the other one. Um, John 8.31 and following, Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word. You are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants. We have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, Whosoever commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not abide in the house forever, but the son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Free from what? From sin. Whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. When a person has behaviors that are improper, substandard, you know, non-Christian behaviors, and cannot stop them just by deciding to stop, they demonstrate that they are slaves of sin. There are some things that you can stop just by deciding to stop. You can just say, boy, I... I've, I've been oversleeping the past three days. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to set my alarm for earlier, and I'm going to put it across the room where I have to get up out of bed, and I'm going to change my behavior here. And you can do that. But there are things where the human nature is in bondage and cannot just change because it decides to do so. This needs liberation. This needs a deliverer, a savior. And Jesus said, you'll be made free from this kind of bondage. How? Well... If you continue in my words, you'll be my disciples indeed, and you'll know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Well, how is it that so, such people will know the truth? Because they continue in his words. His words are the truth. 
And so as you dwell on and obey and heed and surrender yourself to the truth that is found in Jesus' words and in the words of God in general, this makes you free. Misbehavior almost always arises from deception. The devil gets you to do what's wrong or your flesh gets you to do wrong because you are at the moment thinking wrongly about something. You're not paying attention to the remote consequences of wrong behavior. Uh, You may not even have any uh, access to knowledge of what the consequences will be. God knows, but you don't. It's by lack of knowing. It's uh, It's by deception of the enemy. It's by ignorance. People perish because of ignorance, the Bible says. But the truth when you, the more truth you have, the less ignorance, the less deception. And therefore, the less sin. Now, you don't need only to know the truth. You need the Spirit, too. But we have both. The Spirit gives us the ability. The truth tells us what it is that's been hanging us up and why we need to stop. And uh, the truth about who we are, the truth about who God is, the truth about what needs to be done are all found in Scripture. The Bible has all the answers. I'm fully convinced of that. And therefore, following Jesus, submitting to his word, obeying and believing what he said, this sort of delivers us from our self-rule, our self-idolatry. Doing what I want to do has got to be surrendered to doing what Jesus said to do. It's the shift of lordship. Deny yourself and make him the Lord instead of yourself. The word of God will give you the truth that will make you free. Furthermore, the Word of God gives counsel, specific counsel, about what to do. What do you go to a counselor for? Well, generally speaking, most people don't go for counsel. They go for counseling. And that's a different thing. Counseling usually means psychotherapy of some sort. But counsel is what we need. We need the counsel of God. In Psalm 119 and verse 24, it says, Your testimonies are my delight and my counselors. God's testimonies, God's words are delightful to me and they are my counselors. I receive all the counseling I need from them. In Psalm, 105, uh, Psalm 119, verse 105, excuse me, same chapter, different verse. 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I am enlightened. I am counseled. I am directed by the word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for, that is for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, complete. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. What's lacking in that description? There's nothing lacking. You can be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Why? Because God has given his word, which has everything necessary. Now, the final sense in which I'd like to call your attention to the help that we receive from the word of God is that there are great and precious promises in the word of God. And these promises in their fulfillment, uh, change us in the way that we need to be changed. In First P- or Second Peter chapter one, Second Peter chapter one, verses three and four, it says, "As His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue." by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Well, a lot of people who are on the couch, their problem is they have not escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. They are not exhibiting any manifestation of the divine nature, Yet we are partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The divine nature, that's 
the Holy Spirit. That's the, that's the supernatural life of God given to us to change us, to transform us. But through what means? Well, he says, we've been given great and precious promises that by these we can be partakers of the divine nature. Well, what are the great and precious promises? Well, there's many of them. And what I've done with the remainder of these notes is just list of uh, certain categories. There are certainly more. But if you lack, I mean, if, if your problem is in the area of the, the classic problems we've been mentioning, depression, anxiety, anger, insecurity, guilt, uh, broken relationships, uh, whatever, the things that people go to counselors about, uh, they're all covered. Everything's covered. God has made promises. Now, again, we don't use the promises like a magic wand. The promises are simply stating something that is true. And as we count on it being true, that truth is realized in our experience. As we believe, according to your faith, be it unto you, there are promises God has made. As you believe those promises... They are realized in your experience. If you are not finding these are realized in your experience, you're not believing them. You might say you are, but remember there are many degrees of belief. The kind of belief that, that affects you and God, your salvation, that kind of belief is life-changing belief. It's, it's all-consuming belief. Uh, let, me, let me show you an example of what kind of faith it is that saves. You know, the devil has one kind of faith. That doesn't save him. Uh, the, the demons believe and tremble. But there is a way of believing that doesn't help, doesn't change you. Let me give you Paul's model of faith, and that is in, seen in Abraham in Romans chapter 4. Now see if you can uh, sort of make out what, what faith means here in the picture of Abraham, who's the prototype of the man of faith. Romans 4, verse 16 and following. Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed. Now, the, the promises are made sure to us because of grace and faith. Our faith makes the promise sure. Not only to those who are of the law, meaning the Jews, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of all. That is, Abraham is the father of all who have faith. He's the prototype of what faith is. Now he's going to tell us what that faith of Abraham is like. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, in hope, believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, that therefore is an important piece of information. Faith was imputed to Abraham for righteousness. Why? Well, because his faith was like this. Therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Well, what, what do you mean? What kind of faith was it that he had? Certainly, that therefore suggests that if he had had some other kind of faith, some inferior kind of faith, if this was not the kind of faith he had, then it would not have been imputed to him for righteousness. There is a faith that does no good. It gets nothing from God. But the faith that was imputed in for righteousness and the same faith which is the defining trait of all of our link and, and relationship with God is described like this. He was not weak in faith. He didn't consider his own body or did. Now, the promise he was dealing with is that he'd be a father of a multitude. He didn't consider whether his body was capable of, of having children. In fact, it could not. He was past age. Or the deadness of Sarah's womb. His wife was past age. Neither of them could have a baby, yet there was a promise of God to the effect that they would. So he just didn't consider that. He didn't consider anything but the promise of God to be relevant. All challenges, all obstacles were non-considerations. He didn't consider them. 
He didn't waver at the promise of God through unbelief. When he saw the promise of God, he didn't think sometimes I believe it, sometimes I don't believe it. He didn't waver. He just believed that God was able to do what he said. That's what it says. But he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was counted to him for righteousness. His faith was fully convinced. Fully convinced. So much so that it dictated his behavior. His life, his vision, his goals in life were all determined by the total conviction God had given him that he'd be the father of multitude. Why would he wander around the wilderness all alone for 25 years without a child unless he was fully convinced that he was going to have these promises fulfilled? That's a quarter of a century. The man doesn't see any realization of, his, of the promises of God, but he still is fully convinced that it would happen. Therefore, it dictated his actions, his career, everything. In other words, faith is not just a mental thing. Faith is a total consuming dynamic that I believe God so much that nothing is going to sway me from that belief. I'm going to hold on to that belief. I'm going to dictate all my behavior based on the, on the authenticity of what God has said and its truthfulness. Even if all natural considerations seem to be contrary to it, let God be true. Now, what kind of promises do we have? Well, I won't take the time to turn to them because we just don't have the time here and what time remains. Let me get, just kind of survey them. What about concerning peace? If a person has anxiety, they don't have peace. But Jesus said in John 16, 33, These things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Cheer up. Be of good cheer, he says. You will have tribulation, not a very cheering thought, but in me you will have peace. So cheer up. If you are anxious and depressed, you don't have this peace. You must not not be obedient. (laughs) Because he said to cheer up. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You'll have peace in me. In Philippians 4, verses 6 through 9, Paul said, Be anxious about nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things, the things which you've learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. You'll have the peace of God and the God of peace. If what? Well, you don't allow yourself to be anxious. That's forbidden. In verse 6, you lay everything at God's feet. You cast your cares upon him. You come in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, make your requests known. And the peace of God will keep you. Keep your mind on the things. Meditate on these things. If you don't have peace, you are not doing those things. And taking an anti-anxiety drug is not an adequate or legitimate substitute for doing what God said. You will have the peace of God if you do what God said about it. There is promise of comfort in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5. There's the promise of joy in John 15, 11. In John 16, 24. In John 13, 7. Jesus said, if you do these things, I tell you, your joy will be full. There's promise of self-control. Of course, in Galatians 5, 23, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. There's promises of guidance in the Scripture. Psalm 32, 8 and 9. As well as other places. There's promise of strength to help. Isaiah 41, 10. God says, I'll uphold you by my the right hand of my Faithfulness. Do not be afraid. Hebrews 4.16 says we can receive grace to help in time of need. There's promise of victory over sin in Romans 6.14. And in 1 Corinthians 10.13, no temptation will taken you, but God will give you a way out of it. There's promise of forgiveness in 1 John 1.7-9. 1, 
And there's, pro- there's promises of deliverance and safety in Psalm 91 and many other places. These are just samples. These are the great and precious promises. If you believe those things, you're going to be a well-adjusted, happy person. You'll have your low spots and high spots, but you will be walking in the counsel of God. You'll be like a tree planted by rivers of water. And you will...